Sharon, brother and sister, how are you? I'm Johnny Leong. Today I want to share with you this topic to know the spiritual identity and status of believers as new kingdom citizens in Christ. My study is based on Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. Let's start with opening prayer. Dear Abba Father, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better. May the eyes of our heart be enlightened in order that we, we, know, we may know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in your holy people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So our study, the purpose is to know our identity in Christ. In Christ, are you an infant or an adult, brother and sister? An infant who lives who lives on milk or mature one who can eat solid food. I'm a Christian for 30 years, but to tell the truth, I think for the last 27 years, I live as an infant. I attend church regularly. I join sales group, prayer meeting, crusade, conference, but I do not know the my real identity in Christ. So for those people who do not know your real identity in Christ, right, you are still an infant. Let's move forward and see here. Let's read the Ephesians chapter 4, 14 here. Then we will no longer be infant tossed back and forth by the waves and wrong here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. The next one is Hebrew chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. In fact, by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truth of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use had trained themselves to distinguish good and evil. Dr. A. W. Poder, he said something very, very shocking is tens of thousands, perhaps millions, have come into some kind of religious experience by accepting Christ and they have not been saved. So, and First Peter four eighteen tell us that, and also if the righteous are ba barely saved, and what will happen to godless sinner? If the righteous are barely saved, do we, what do you think we need to look into our faith seriously as a mature Christian, or man, or maintain ourselves as an infant in the church? I asked one of my Korean teacher, my Korean Bible school teacher, right, from Salang Church. There are hundred thousand attendance in the church there but i think he told me about maybe 70 percent to 90 percent right are not really safe people because people just go to church on sunday for two hours just for the worship and then in their life they no change they just they still live in the world or maybe they are barely like first peter say barely saved by the grace of god so my friend it is important to know our righteousness in Christ by the grace of God. We will talk into detail in Ephesians chapter 2 because of His grace. We are predestined into the plan of God so that we are adopted into the sonship of Christ. It is important to know our identity so that we will not fall down or lose our faith. This man is John Calvin was a French theologian, pastor, and reformer in Genoa during the Protestant Reformation. He said the book Ephesians is his favorite book. Even John McKay, former dean, president of Princeton Theology Seminary, was deeply moved by this book of Ephesians, wrote with confidence saying that, I have been blessed by this book of my whole life. 
So the more efficient changed many people's life. Not only John Kerry, John McKay, also John Stock and also other teacher, pastor and theologian, including Johnny Leong. My life started to change because after I really focused to study on the book of efficient. Today, let's look at the topic and also the outline for our study today. We will go to the introduction and also the biblical background of Ephesians. Also, we will talk about the blessing of believer in Christ at chapter 1, verse 3 to 33. Also, the believer spiritual position in Christ, chapter 2, verse 1 to 22. And also, how we apply this in our life if we know that our position in Christ and how do we live in Christ, okay. Let me talk about the context and background of the book of Ephesians. The Korean, the Colossian church was greatly disturbed by heresies, and the truth was confused. Believers are at risk of being deceived by the teachers of other religions. Paul one believer to really know the mystery of Christ when he was in prison, Rome, Roman prison, he wrote the book of Ocarosian. In the meantime, he also wrote the book of Ephesians. Let's read Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. So, the purpose is also to establish the identity of the believer to know who and I in Christ, so as not to be deceived by heresy, remind believer of the importance of living in Christ and in unity in Christ. The brother and the sister. Here are very important vocabulary in the book of vision. Number one is in Christ. Also, one in Christ, priest designation, mystery, know him better these are the five important vocabulary we need to really understand the meaning because the word's meaning is really deep i truly believe that if we know the meaning understand truly from our heart our life will be truly transformed from infant to be mature christian Before I really go started to read chapter one, right? Let's give me a bit time to also give you a bit introduction about the book of Ephesians. The theme is the glorious church of God. Ephesians occupy a high place in the spiritual and theological writings of the church. Ephesians was once hailed as the masterpiece of Paul Ephesus. The two most influential episodes of Paul Ephesus are Romans and Ephesians. Many people regard the book of Ephesians as a part of Paul writings, known as the crown and pinnacle of Paul's, Paul's theology. In church history, the book of Ephesians is well loved and called God's treasure in Christ. The apps of the New Testament, the bank of believers, etc. etc. And furthermore, the book of Ephesians also considered named as the letter for today. Some people call Ephesians the episode of the day precisely because most of the content of this book can be written to any churches or believers today. It covers the episode of New Testament thought and this book teaches us to understand God's plan of redemption, God's expectation for believers. Believers had great wealth inheritance and riches in Jesus Christ and his church and tell us how to enjoy the blessing as a new kingdom citizen. This book is a blueprint for the church building, church building, church planting, a book that believers must read and understand it. That's why Dr. Milton Wan Wai Yao, Wen Wei Yao Bo Shi, Former press professor of Divinity School of Chongqi College, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, once mentioned this. 
in one sentence. As a Christian grow up, at least one book in the Bible is required to know fully well. We indeed research and study. We can get, understand at least one book in the Bible or in one chapter or one verse, right? It will gradually be integrated into the Word of God and help the believer to grow in their faith. So, this book is a blueprint for the church, a book for the believe for the believer must really understand. And the goal of this study of the book of Ephesians is to help believers to understand their true identity and status in Christ, position in Christ, pay attention to the change of status, realize the true status and position of citizen of the kingdom of God, the new people. And I truly encourage you and me to really spend time to read the book of Ephesians. Out of 66 books in the Bible here, every books are important. I do read a lot. I, I, I like to read like Genesis, Revelation, Psalm, Proverbs, Isaiah, Matthew, John, Roman, Hebrews. Every book I also read. But if you want to choose one book only for you to read, that's only efficient. Because first of all, only six chapters, very short. Not only that, but the content is so deep and comprehensive. If you really can study the book of Ephesians very well, right? You, your life will be changed. For sure. Okay, let's look at the important points. Normally, the important point will say five times, right? So that this study today is let you know the true identity in Christ. And also, as a new kingdom citizen, let us put off our old self and put on our new self. It will be talked about in chapter 4, verse 22 and 23. Also, let live a life worthy of the calling. Chapter 4, verse 1. And Ephesians is divided into two sections. First three chapter is an emphasis on doctrine, win the choice for a believer, for you to believe, and how we can adjust the identity and position of believer in Christ. Then the last chapter, three chapter, chapter four to six, is emphasized on period. If we know our identity as a child of God, as a new kingdom citizen, we need to change our life, we cannot live at the old. How can we live in the new self as a child of God? And to live a spiritual life in Christ. Let's go straight to the outline of the book vision. Here we're talking about the Paul's reading, chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. Also, we're talking about our fullness in Christ, chapter 1, verse 3 to chapter 3, verse 21. It's a calling of the church. So here we've been talking about the spiritual blessing in Christ, and we will praise the triune God. The word of God the Father, the word of Christ, the word of the Holy Spirit, also a prayer for wisdom and revelation. Then the next section we talk about our spiritual position in Christ, the believer new position in Christ, also the unity of believer in Christ. Here got different set subtitle here. We were talking about it in the later part of this presentation. Okay, let us start. Paul's greeting, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. Let us read together. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Saints mean God's holy people. So Paul called people in Ephesians. Saints in Ephesians, Ephesus. So you guys are also saints in Pinang. Sense in Kuala Lumpur, sense in Seoul. So now I can call you Sen, Sen Nikki, Sen Pastor Sam, Sen Pastor Bernard. Okay, follow on our spiritual blessing in Christ from chapter 1, verse 3 to 23. Let's read the chapter 1, verse 3 to 6 here. Together, let's read together. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for the adoption of the sonship to Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loved. So here I highlight in Christ, in him, to Jesus Christ, in the one he loved. All this is very important words we need to understand from now. So let's look at what we see from this chapter 1 here. Is time. Time is eternity before the creation of the world. Matter, matter is chosen by God. Object. People of God. Purpose. Become holy and blameless in His sight. Motive. He loves us. God loves you and me. Result. Predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. Goal is to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loved. Hallelujah. Let's further into what is a spiritual blessing in Christ. There are some examples here. Let us read together. Christians are saints in Christ, chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed in Christ, chapter 1, verse 3. Chosen in Christ, chapter 1, verse 4. Also, sonship in Christ. Enjoy love in Christ, redemption in Christ, forgiveness of sin, participation in God's great plan in Christ. Also, glorify in Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Alive with Christ, created in Christ, approaching God in Christ, growing in Christ, built in Christ, Call air with and share in Christ. Hallelujah. God's greater purpose in choosing and saving us is for His own glory, for the praise of His glorious grace. The Christian life all begin in Christ. Hallelujah. So, our spiritual blessing in Christ, what does it mean of a Christian living in two places in the same time? Paul, reader in Ephesians, they are lived in the area of Ephesus and were also living in Christ. Both are important. Today, you guys are living in Penang. You guys are living in Kuala Lumpur. You guys are living in Seoul. You are living in your city now. You're also living in Christ. Both are very important. Physically, you live in Meaning now, but in the spiritual realm, you are in Christ. So, since this blessing are already given to the believer, they should not, they should not ask for them, but should receive them by faith. Let's look at our blessing in Christ. The blessed in Christ. A believer is a person in Christ. Blessed are believers who are in Christ. Believers have believed in Christ and their identity and status are already in Christ. Believers are one with Christ and enjoy a unified identity with Christ. Blessed are believers who are in Christ. The Lord Jesus also said, Abide in me, I am in you, and I am the Father are one. The parable of the vine is that the Lord Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and I in you. John 15, verse 4 to 7. Now we look at the salvation is the predestination of believer. Predestined to be adopted as sons to Jesus Christ. Predestination is the predestined identity for believers to be adopted as sons to Jesus Christ, the mediator, to become fully children of God. This shows that God the Father Prepare the plan of salvation and the Son accomplish salvation. The two work together. This is all the grace of God given by God and cannot be boasted without any human effort. As a result of God's grace and chosen, believers become His children. Hallelujah. 
Let's further look into what is priest destination. Priest destination point out that God's plan of salvation is not a temporary plan but a long term plan. This is a plan to save people so that the priest destination refers to the blueprint for the salvation of the world, not the priest destination of who can go to heaven or who can't. This blueprint means salvation. Is left to Jesus Christ to execute, and it is up to people to decide who is safe or who is not. It's, the, it's their own decision to believe Jesus or not. And let me talk about my personal experience and my understanding about predestination. I used to think that is God already predestined who can go heaven, who cannot. That's why I am predestined by God to become child of God, so that mean. Before the creation of the world, God already decided, okay, Johnny, you become his children, his child. So you can so that it made me feel different and maybe a bit a bit proud because I'm child of God. But actually, when I really understand the priest destination, the meaning here, right? In fact, God before the creation of the world, God already pre prepared, predestined this salvation plan. Because the man fell, man sinned, so that fall right, fall short of the righteousness of God. And Jesus came, Jesus came 2,000 years ago, crucified on the cross, fulfilled the salvation from human beings. Today, I believe Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I become children of God. So I also predestined in the plan of God before the creation of the world. So as you, you accept Jesus as your Savior, you also predestined in the, in the plan of God before the creation of the world. Hallelujah. So when I know this, I feel so rejoiced and humble because it's not my, it's not myself, anything special. It's all by the grace of God. It's so important. We know the truth. We know the important meaning of the words here in the book of Ephesians. So when I study the book of Ephesians, I keep on fall in love with the teaching, the power, the love, the grace of God in the book of Ephesians. Okay, now we look at the word of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6 to 12 here. Let us read together. To the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loved, in Him. We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. Hallelujah. We will look into the detail of what is the word of Christ here. It is true, redemption to His blood and also reward the believers with all kinds of wisdom and understanding. So the word redemption here means liberation from captivity, especially from slavery to liberation. The pride is that Christ redeemed His life with Redeems our life with his own life. So, redemption produces forgiveness. This is the main reason the Christ came and died for us on the cross. So that today we become the righteousness of God in Christ. Hallelujah. And also the reward believer will be all kind of wisdom understanding. Wisdom is objective insight to understand the spiritual things of God while understanding emphasize the subjective ability to understand the will of God. So we need really the wisdom to understand. And the, we need the wisdom and understand to understand what God has planned for us. Hallelujah. 
and this one is given by by Christ helping us to understand the wisdom of God now we look at the mysteries of believer in God's will Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 to 10 let us read together he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. What is the mystery of God will that Paul refer to? The New Testament used the word mystery which refers to a long closed things that is now revealed. The focus of this passage is on God's plan of salvation in the end time. So in verse 1, 10 here, in chapter 1, verse 10 here, when the time reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, is that God wants Christ to rule and govern the fullness of the time, the fullness of time. This word is about the eternity, sovereignty, sovereignty of Christ. And it is translated as together. And the word means that the whole universe is in Christ. The focal point that holds all things together. The focus is all. Christ is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Lord of all. In the process of realization of God's plan, the church must strive to realize the purpose of unity revealed by God in Jesus Christ. This is a central and main idea of the Book of Visions. So what is the mystery of God's view? What do these mysteries have to do with us? Many of the spatial meaning of in the New Testament are considered mysteries and can be summarized as the following here. First one, the mystery is Christ. Number two, the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. Christ dwell among believers. The mystery of the gospel of Christ. Jew and Gentiles are one in the church. The Messiah did come in the Old Testament. Christ is the bridegroom and the church is his bride. The rapture of the church. The end of history, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. It will be end of his history when the time is fulfilled according to the arrangement. Also in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 to 6. Then God will bring all things to himself forever and ever. In his name, new heavens and new earth will be created. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Number 10. The whole universe fully united under Christ. First Corinthians chapter 15. So this is a mystery. And to understand the mystery, we need the wisdom and understanding. Hallelujah. Look at the mystery again here. What does this mean to do with us? All being a one family in Christ. Yeah, the mystery of God will expand our spiritual horizon, allowing us to better understand ourselves and the great commission of the church. Before the creation of the world, God chose us to be part of His church. One day, all beings will be one family in Christ. Therefore, believers cannot only understand God's great and mysterious, mysterious plan in history, but we are also a part of this great and eternal mysterious plan. We have the mission to let all people know God and belong to God. And the church might also strive to be engaged in Christ, in Jesus. The purpose of revelation and unity is real life. It becomes the golden lamp stamp in the world. It becomes the testimony of God and it becomes the temple for people to know God. First, God not only chosen his people in Christ in eternity past before the creation of the world. He also giving them sonship today to enjoy the joy and the blessing and the responsibility for it. One day, this divided nature, the world, and the human race will all be brought under the control of Christ, become an incomparable unity. It is a plan that in the fullness of time, 
everything in heaven on earth and everything will exist in harmony and eternity in jesus christ in the new heavens and new earth created by god united and ruled by christ this is the ultimate goal of god's glory plan the secret of god's plan are in christ an open secret accessible to all believers today and apostle paul directly explained the mystery of god's glorious will so that believers could understand how glorious the coming day of the lord jesus christ will be hallelujah now we look at the number four the believers are god's solid inheritance let us read ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 here together furthermore because we are united with christ we have received an inheritance from god for he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan vision 1 11. this inheritance is predestined by god emphasizing the predestined unchangeable method of his plan to us in him believers are chosen for inheritance blessed are the believers god has chosen among the nation to be his inheritance his testimony when paul speaks of inheritance and property he means that the church is wholly owned by god that is god's children god's people god's sense god's inheritance and god's holy people believers are adopted by god to share with christ the sonship of god and thus share in the sonship and inheritance of god dear brother and sister let us look at what is the purpose of christ's work here christ the purpose of christ's work is in ephesians chapter 1 12. let us read together in order that we who were the first to put our hope in christ might be for the praise of his glory so we are for to praise god to pray for his glory what is the work of the holy spirit here the answer in ephesians chapter 1 13 and 14. let's read together and you also were included in christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation when you believe you were marked in him with a seal the promised holy spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are god's procession to the praise of his glory Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 to 14. so the word of the holy spirit is two parts the seal of the holy spirit and also the deposit guarantee of the holy spirit so what is the seal of the holy spirit so when you heard the truth the gospel of your salvation believe in christ you were sealed with the promise of the holy spirit god redemption also come to you I mean gentile and the gospel is a life giving truth from god believer receive the promised holy spirit as a seal or guarantee for future life with god before god before the goods are shipped and consigned the seal must be stamped to prove the type of goods inside the letter should also be stamped to prove the content is valid a seal a seal is evidence of authenticity and also ownership promises given by the holy spirit to believers to prove that they belong to god god seals us because he has redeemed us to be his own first corinthians chapter 6 19 to 20. so the seal of the holy spirit also means safety and protection for us for as his believer so what is the deposit guarantee of the holy spirit here this holy spirit the evidence of our inheritance Press under the people of God, the people are redeemed. 
The Holy Spirit guarantees our inheritance in Jesus Christ with not only His seal but also His deposit guarantee. This guarantees the believer's redemption and inheritance in heaven. Certificate means down payment, deposit, and was used to refer to any guarantee, even an engagement ring. Those who have tasted the Holy Spirit have begun to taste the life of the world to come. The world God has promised His people. We Christians are God's people, redeemed and now awaiting the full realization of their redemption. God's people are God's inheritance. The ultimate purpose of the work of the Holy Spirit in God's redemption, so that His glory, His glory is praised. Hallelujah. Now we look into the prayer for wisdom and revelation. This is Paul's prayer in chapter 1, verse 13 to 23. Let's read together. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's procession to the praise of His glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. I keep asking that the God our Lord Jesus Christ, the Godless Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know Him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people and His incompar incomparably great power for us who believe that power is the same as the mighty strength He exerted when He raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly realm. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, invoke, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, fulfill everything in every way. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 to 23. So let us look into Paul's prayer here. Can we say into two parts? He prays for believers and also pray for wisdom for the people, for saints. God our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of God, by mentioning God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son side by side. The God of all glory is the one with the Lord Jesus Christ. Give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. Hallelujah. Paul specifically pray that God will grant us the power or understanding to recognize the resources we have. So this one important. Paul's prayer mentioned may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. So I want to really understand this will actually also change my life. When I really know who I am in Christ, who is Christ Jesus, and what is grace of God, it changed my life. So here Paul specifically pray that God want us the what God would grant us the power or understanding to recognize the resources we have. Before we can serve, we must know and understand our position in the Lord. We must know that what we have before we can use them appropriately. God's power is to change His people. And that's what Ephesians deal with Christians must realize that what they have in Christ, what they have hoped to have in the future. For those whose life is short and meaningless, we must pass on the hope to them that there will be a future that belongs to God and God will not abandon them. 
Christ is the head and the church is the body. The head must work by the body and the church is, is the hands that, that do the work of Christ, the feet that run on his mission, the voice that speaks his word. The church is the complement of Christ. Christ gradually put all things in their proper place and this is the work of the church. The church is his body, the fullness of the one who fulfills all things. A world that God has planned is in the hands of the church. Just as the idea of the head cannot be accomplished without the work of the body, the great glory that Christ brought to the world cannot be accomplished without the work of the church. It is the work of the church that Christ gradually put all things in their proper place. So let me summary in the chapter 1 here. The first chapter of Ephesians, God, Paul speaks of God's eternal plan to his chosen people who are predestined to receive God's sonship and that believer and everything in heaven and on earth will be brought together in Christ, the head of the church, all unity become one in Christ. In chapter 2 and 3, we will talk about how God carried out His eternal plan of turning sinners into saints, His holy people, putting them into the church, the body of Christ. Now we go into chapter 2. The believer new position in Christ and also the unity of believer in Christ. So here in the new position in Christ, we were talking about the former situation, which is life in sin, and the present situation, salvation in Christ, and the purpose of the change to do good in the new creation. So let us go into the detail now. And here we can say is the main point of Paul theologies of salvation appear many in chapter 2 verse 1 to 20. God's salvation in Christ, past, present and future will all be seen here. So let us read Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Let us read together. As for you, you were dead in your transgression and sin in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the craving of our flesh and following its desire and thought. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. So this is talking about the former situation when the life is still in sin. Basically, believers are in a very corrupt, hateful, dark, and miserable state before they are saved. They have lost their God of ten goals and fall into spiritual death. Paul emphasized that their true spiritual condition was death in trespasses and sin. And the death is not primarily a physical death, but a loss of the spiritual life given. So here we can see the world is under three dark forces. The first one, the custom of this world, referring refer to the order, value system and rules of the world and the way of life of people. Unbelievers are living in conformity with the custom of the world, which is an age of weakness, fornication and depressity. Number two, Obedient to living creature in the spiritual world, namely Satan, the devil, the leader of the air, is also an evil spirit operating in the heart of the children of disobedience. So, Satan is a head of all sinful activities. The third one is indulge the fall and follow the lust of the flesh and heart. Desire to become master without God, refer to the self-centered nature of fallen man, cattle, Characterized by complacency, boasting, and hatred. Roman 8 6 telling us that the mind governed by the flesh is death, and the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. 
So we need to put on the full armor of God. So in the Ephesians chapter 6, right, as a believer in Christ, we are actually in the war with the spiritual, in, the, in this spiritual world. That's why we need to put on the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the righteous blade, blade the bucket of truth. All this is so important as a believer in Christ for, to protect ourselves so that, so that we are safe and also protected in the love of God in Christ. Hallelujah. Now we look at the present situation, chapter 2, verse 4 to 7. Let us read together. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgression, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, He might show the incompar incomparable riches of His grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 7. The state of unbelieving in the Lord is death in trespasses and sin, and the light of death. And now, because of Jesus, it is a living life. This, the position of believer in the Spirit is in heaven. And they are no longer just people on earth, but citizens of heaven, no longer of the present world, nor under its power of sin and rebellion. After people believe in the Lord and receive the seal of the Holy Spirit, they become a third type of person. From the perspective of God, they are neither Gentile or Jews, but the Church of God. The Church is also called the body of Christ. Therefore, this shows that the believer united with Christ has obtained the heavenly status and right. So what a great news for believer! Hallelujah. So we look at number three. The purpose of change here is to do good in the new creation. Let us read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. Let us read together. For it is by grace you have been saved to faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. The redemption of man is entirely by the grace of God. This anyone should boast. Salvation does not originate from man himself, nor does it depend on man's deed. It is entirely a free gift of God and entirely God's work. Therefore, for believers, to do good is to live obedient, fruitful life, to carry live the life, the right way of life. Therefore, doing good works is the purpose and the result of believers in salvation. So we are called to do good in the new creation. So there are three purposes for believers to be saved by grace. There are three purposes. Very interesting. Number one, to make known to future generations the riches of His grace, the kindness which He has shown to us in Christ Jesus. So here, to make known also means display to people, means to show or demonstrate through the salvation of Christ Jesus to be revealed to the world and to the world for eternity. God's grace and mercy are upon all who need salvation. Number two, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself but the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. The biggest sin of man is to consider God a liar. So, the great this is all the grace of God, then no cause is also based on man's faith. Salvation is something man cannot do, not by ourselves, but it is given by God, lest anyone should boast. And it is all the work of God, the core light of salvation is the act of God. Salvation is done by God, not by man. So, as here mentioned, the biggest sin of man is to consider God as a liar. Do not believe in Him. So this is the biggest sin. Number three, we are His workmanship, 
created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are the fruit of His work. The new, this new creation takes place in Christ Jesus. This new creation is based on the resurrection of Christ, a new life created in the midst of death. God's new creation in us is to prepare believers for good works. This new creation is to be dynamite and productive like each creator, by our God, in order for us to do good, is for us to live an obedient and fruitful life, for us to clearly live the right way of life. Now we look into the unity of believer in Christ. There are three things we're going to talk now. It's about the statement of unity, interpretation of unity, and also the result of unity. So what is the unity of believer in Christ? Number one, we're talking about the, a statement of unity. Formerly far away from God, now nearer. Let read Ephesians chapter 2, 11 to 13. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentile by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you, who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. So here we need to look into first believer to reflect on what it was like before they were not saved by grace, totally worldly, attracted and possessed by the world. The second is devilish. In fact, the Gentile had almost no part in Israel's spiritual status, a lie in the devil's control and bondage. There are also carnal ones living in obedience to the arrangement of the flesh and indulging in the lust of the flesh. Now, this is the important turning point. This turn of the event is in Christ Jesus, his blood, and brings those who were far away near. The phrase already approached here can have two meanings. It means having drawn near to God and it means having drawn near to all who are in Christ. And we are going to talk about the spiritual isolation here. They got five things very important we need to talk about. At the time you were aliens from Christ, aliens from the nation of Israel, aliens from the covenant of promise and live without hope and without God. So A here, for Gentile, we are no Christ. We had the absence of Christ, had nothing to do with the Jewish hope. B, outside the nation of Israel, meaning nothing to do with God who founded the nation of Israel, nothing to do with the love of God. C, outsider in promise. We had nothing to do with the covenant of God's grace, of God's promise and covenant with Abraham. D. No hope. We have no hope. Eternal life. Never born is better than born. E. There is no God. There is no true God for Gentile. So now we are talking about B. What is the interpretation of unity here? Let us read the chapter 2 verse 14 to 18. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of the hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with his command and regulation, his purpose was to create for in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For to him, we both had access to the Father by one Spirit. Ephesians 2, verse 14 to 18. So here we can see, to make a new human through the death of Christ on the cross, Jesus fulfilled the law. We do not need to follow the law, but we live out of the law, we live out of the requirement of the law through Holy Spirit inside us because Jesus already fulfilled the law. 
in Christ, Jews and Gentiles are no longer opposed. So they are one in Christ now. Believers are no longer separated and become one in Christ. Jews and Gentiles, by agreeing, by agreeing to be in the Holy, Holy Spirit, had access to the Father and become members of the single body of Christ. The cross is the foundation of reconciliation between hostile nations. The power of the cross is always valid. The gospel is the only solution to the world divided by hatred and enmity. Therefore, the mission of the church is to evangelize and thereby achieve reconciliation. This makes it clear that Christ, there is no longer any distinction between Jews and Gentiles, have become the new man of Christ. Therefore, the function of the cross is to reconcile everyone to God. And it also reminds believers of their mission is to spread and share the gospel of peace to people. In the unity of believers in Christ, here there are three categories of people in the world today. The first is Jews, the second is Gentile, the third is the Church of Jesus Christ, mean Christian. That's why the theme of Ephesians is the glorious church. You and I are church of Jesus Christ, are church of God. So we are the body of Christ. And we are the third category of people, human beings in the world today. Now we're looking at the last slide of the day. The result of unity is being built together as the dwelling place of God. So we read together Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostle and prophet, with Christ himself as a chief cornerstone in him. The whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord and in Him. You two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Ephesians 2, 19-22 The parable of the building of the temple is used here. It is explained that believers are the building material. Christ is the cornerstone. The apostle and prophet are the foundation of the temple. The Holy Spirit is the master who dwells in the temple. The temple is the church. The foundation of the church, the apostle and prophet must be properly connected with Christ. All other believers are built on this foundation and Christ connects them in the church. In Christ, the whole building is fitted, fitted by the Lord, built by the Lord, to be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The privilege we receive from God through our salvation tend to make us proud like the Pharisees. And despite others who do not know this privilege, if we do, then we forget that our privilege are come from union with Christ, not from ourselves. Worship and obedience are the only appropriate response to God's calling. Dear brother and sister, how do we live as a Christian? How do we live in Christ? When you truly understand the identity and status of a believer, your life and mind will change greatly. Believers should truly understand and live up the life as life of a God's kingdom citizen. As Paul said in Ephesians 4.1, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So here the important thing is our identity and status in Christ, God's predestination before creation, God's plan for salvation for believers, God's plan for salvation for believers, the mystery of knowing the will of God, really know the word of God, the kindness shown to believers in Christ Jesus revealed to later generation. The believer is his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do good. So, how do I live in Christ every day, and how do I truly know 
what he is will change the, our life as a believer. So we are not just talking about go to church every Sunday for two hours or serving, but six days in life we live in the world, just focus our world. We don't even read the Bible. We don't even in Christ. In Christ means 24 by 7. In Christ means how, we, how do we do it? So our goal is to live in Christ every day, ready to do what God leads us to do. So the matter is hungry and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. As mentioned in Matthew chapter 5. So my suggestion is, if you do not know which book in the Bible, you should really read. Focus on the book efficient first. Read the book efficient, study well to understand the truth. You can spend like 10 minutes a day just to listen to the one whole book of the book efficient. And the Holy Spirit will guide you, will help you to grow in your faith. And you can start to read other books as well. So, I want to make a conclusion today for chapter 1 and chapter 2. Through the study of vision, believers are blessed by the redemption of Lord Jesus Christ. Through the redemption predestined by God before creation, it is a great grace for believers to become children of God because of their belief in the Lord. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The redeeming love of the Father in Christ changed the believer's spiritual position, the nature of life and inner attitude. This redeeming love is eternal. Therefore, the Christian life should be a continuous process of daily change to work, humility and piety. So as a believer, to understand their identity and standing in Christ, they will grow more and more eager to come to know God. Through the work of redemption in Christ, we can also recognize the mission of the church, which is to bring people to God, to strive for harmony between people, and to build a universal church based on God's love and God's redemption. It is possible to participate in and fulfill the Lord's great commission. Thank you for joining me, brother and sister. If we really know our identity in Christ, right? Our life will be different. So it is important for us to know the mystery of God. What is the predestination of God's plan for you and me? And know our identity in Christ. And also help, let us know Him better more and more every single day. Thank you for joining me today. Listen to my sharing in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. May God bless you and lead you and guide you. May Holy Spirit lead you every day in your life. Thank you for joining me. God bless. Hallelujah.